got me today, all right? Uh, if you're, <laughs> oh no, no, wait, you want to hold that, okay? Uh, no, I'm just the only guy in town, you know? So, uh, actually, looking out here today, uh, I'm actually, I, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but I didn't know if anybody would be here today. There's a lot of folks traveling, um, but man, y'all showed up, and it is great to have you. Um, uh, if you're new, uh, maybe first time you're from out of town, like you came to Louisville for Fourth of July weekend, you know, uh, then welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we, we like to engage our newer folks by texting, grabbing your phones. It's totally okay to pull your phone out in church if you'll text the keyword new to this number on the screen. Otherwise, put your phones away, all right? Uh, but if you're going to text new, then, then grab your phone and do that. And that's just how we... Um, send you advertisements. No, uh, that's how we engage with you. We, we would like to follow up with you and have a, actually a human conversation, but we just know that technology today, that's just a way to kind of get your attention for us, for you to raise your hand without actually raising your hand in church. Um, I grew up in church where visitors stood, introduced themselves, uh, you know, all that, but you can text and be anonymous, but we'd love to, to follow up with you. So new people, shoot that text to us. Um, and then also, uh, I want to talk about giving for a minute because your generosity, your giving allowed us to do some significant ministry in the past week. Uh, last Sunday, I asked you to, and we prayed in our service for some things happening here on campus as well as our, our students um, at conferences. And uh, uh, let, let me start with the conferences. Um, our high schoolers were up in Michigan for CIY, and, and they said the water, Lake Michigan was 55 degrees, and I want you to know your, your student minister, Tyler, took the plunge, man. He, he led by example, you know, by, by getting into that water, and, but actually, they had a, an incredible week, and we're just going to start mining stories out of that. They just got back, like yesterday, I think, so we'll tell you more about that, but just pay attention, because the evidence will be obvious in these kids' lives and the sponsors who went with them in the coming weeks. Uh, CIY is a transformative experience that they don't leave from the same. One of the things we prayed for was that God would just prompt those maybe even into full-time ministry. And that happens, that actually happens, and it comes to fruition. And, and so let's look forward to the fruit from that experience with our students um, throughout the week here on campus, if you happen to come by dropping food off or helping with the food pantry, you know it was pretty crazy around here. We had a bunch of elementary age uh, school, uh, elementary age kids with the Woodlands camp team here, and I loved it. You know, I kind of kept my distance because you know I was a little nervous, but uh, they just had an amazing week. We did host some of the workers at our at our house, which was cool. But just an amazing week for our students, and it's because we got a facility to be able to host that. Um, I, I know the camp team. The, just talking to them, it's so far, they said this was their favorite place. And I think they really meant it, you know. Um, they're in a lot of churches over the summer, but they just loved being here, loved the facility, loved you guys and the kids. And so thanks for being a host uh, for them. And then, of course, Friday night. I don't know if you got into the service early enough to see some of the video from Friday night, but I'm telling you, it was an epic night on our campus Friday night. And uh, I want to, I just want you to thank, and, and I want to say thank you publicly to, to the guy that kind of is point on that, um, but he will point all the credit to his team and volunteers. But Anthony Dunning, our local outreach director, and Sarah, his assistant, and an army of volunteers made Friday night happen. Would you let them know you appreciate that? Yeah. And I'm going to brag on my wife this serve. She was in last service, but uh, she is, she's not like big on um, meat, like us guys, you know, especially hamburger. But she worked her tail off frying burgers and putting cheese on them and putting them in buns. And, and that just shows you what can happen when we all come together. All right. <laughs> She'll appreciate that. I think she's sitting back there listening in the green room, but um, uh, a lot of great things happened, and uh, just, again, because you, you guys funded it, all right? This was a free event. Every hot dog, every hamburger, every firework, every bouncy, all of it, 
um, was funded through our general fund giving. And so our community, and I mean, there were a bunch of our community on our campus were blessed by that. And if you were here, you know what I mean. If, if you weren't, just trust me. Um, seeds were planted, invitations were given. Some of you, you might be here t- today, first time because of Summerfest. Um, but uh, thank you for that. And I just wanna encourage you to keep it up. Uh, you can text give at any point if you wanna make a contribution, if God's putting that on your heart. Um, but if you're a regular contributor here, just keep that up, be faithful. God's using uh, your uh, time and your talent and your treasure for kingdom purposes. Trust me, he is. And uh, we get to be uh, observers of that, participants in that. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, today, uh, we are continuing in our series through the book Quest 52, but more importantly, I say that the book as in supplemental, because the book we study And the book we take, our coaching, our guidance, our inspiration is none other than scripture itself, the holy inspired word of God. And that is our first source and only authority in how we live. And then guys like Mark Mark Moore who are incredible gifts to believers and churches around the world write books that help us deal with questions that come out of scripture and point us towards answers sometimes, better clarity sometimes, and certainly mystery. And that hopefully happens every week for you because I can tell you one thing, I, Fitz, none of us have all the answers. Mark Moore doesn't have all the answers, but we trust God for it as we study in his word. If you don't have the book yet, we're at the halfway point, and I do want to say congrats to those of you who started the year with us and been faithful plowing through it. Great conversations and encouragement happening in our group study through this um, because Sunday morning, you will get a taste, but I promise you, you will not get enough to really go as deep as we need to. And so for those of you who say, man, I want depth, I want depth, I want depth, then get in the doggone group, all right, and study the word on your own in your private time, if you're waiting for me or Fitz or Anthony or Mark to answer all your questions and to give you full clarity on every ounce of scripture, you will be deeply disappointed on Sunday morning. 30 minutes goes by really, really fast, and our hope is just to create some more curiosity to clarify some things um, and point you in the right direction, okay? So um, we're gonna do that today and deal with this first, or this question in chapter 26. And by the way, if you don't have a book, I meant to say you can grab one in the lobby. Chris will be out there on your way out. You can pick up with us and finish the year strong. This week, can Jesus accept me? Fitz asked me to uh, preach, oh, it's not on the slide, sorry, it's later. Uh, Fitz asked me to uh, preach a sermon, I don't know, last week? Uh, no, it was, it was a few months ago. And absolutely fits, I would love to, but I didn't look specifically at the content and what I was getting myself into until this week when I started preparing them. I'm like, I think I've gotten in over my head. Um, The question is kind of, yeah, of course Jesus can accept me. Let's pray and go home. But then I realized there's a lot more to that, especially if we flip the question, which is what we'll do here in a minute. In doing that, it's about clarity. Sometimes you gotta rephrase questions to get clarity. Sometimes there are things in life and in God's word that we just are maybe confused by or, or need clarity before we move forward. And while God expects us and calls us to walk by faith, I don't think that that is a blind or ignorance is bliss kind of faith. It's an informed faith. And uh, I experienced the importance of clarity, clear information, right information, true information. Recently, uh, when my son called me from Colorado Springs, uh, well, it was actually on his way to Colorado Springs, um, driving my, my car, I had said, hey, you're driving all the way to Colorado with his new wife, Tia, adventure. They're going to see Christy's parents, uh, Mimi and Papa, and I said, why don't you take my car? It's, it's newer, it's got fresh tires, should be all good, man. You know, his car, they're older cars. And, and so off they go. Phone call, hey dad, the check engine light's on. 
And if you're like me, it's like, so? <laughs> you know? Check engine light comes on off. I mean, that's just normal, right? Uh, check engine light, nothing to worry about. And uh, I said, actually, why don't you, uh, uh, when you get in, uh, you only got a couple hours left. When you get in, maybe stop in the Valvoline or, auto, you know, where they can plug in the thing, tell you what's wrong. Read the diagnostic sign, get the code. And so he did that. Called me the next day, said, hey, they said... Uh, it was a PC something code, which meant cylinder one is misfiring. Now, I don't know a thing about cars, and I just said, is it still running okay? You know, like, and he's, sure, and, and off he went. Fast forward to the end of the week, car's overheating, it's not drivable, in fact, the head gasket is blown. Yeah, some of you know. I, I still was, you know, like, so? You know, <laughs> no. uh, mechanic says, don't drive it, you know? And uh, at that point, there's confusion. I'm like, how, you know, what are we gonna do? How do we get there? Son's 1,100 miles away. He's 21, this is new for him. Um, kind of nervous about it. Man, I broke dad's car and just all the things. And, and uh, so we start making calls, and, and at that point, I, it, clarity was important. Like, you know, getting down to what's, what do we need, what's going to happen, what are you going to charge me was like one of the really big questions when it's sitting at the auto place in Colorado Springs, and this guy's looking at the plates, seeing Kentucky, and he's like, I'm going to stick it to this guy, which he, he absolutely did when I got the, the quote. Um, and, uh, and it was like, so that was clear, like, here's your quote. What wasn't clear was, am I actually going to pay this guy that I don't know to work on this car? And by the way, how am I going to get my son and daughter-in-law back to Louisville? Which we were able to deal with that pretty quick, got them on a plane. It was, they had to be back. And so that began a week-long journey of, of a lot of, again, confusion, trying to figure out where and how much and all car, car kind of things. Learned a lot, you know, uh, got frustrated a lot, but fortunately found a local guy who could do it for much less. Then became the issue of getting it back here because it was not drivable, not gonna drive it back. So if you've ever tried to transport a car across the country, that can be, at least for me, was daunting. Um, the thought of calling some dude who I don't know who popped up in Google and is sending me 5,000 literal texts about his car transport company and the deal he can give me. And in fact, those calls were coming from California to Florida, which starts to, you know, like, is this for real or not? If I wire you $600, will I ever see my car again? Um, and I'm thinking, probably not. And, and so I'm like, what am I going to do? I, and everybody talking, nobody's transported a car apparently, you know? And, and so nobody can make a recommendation, on and on and on. Finally, take the plunge. I didn't wire $600. I'm smarter than that, you know. Um, but I did had to pay a deposit to a reputable company. I won't name them because we're not promoting companies here, but... They got it done. My car arrived in Louisville this Wednesday and is going to get repaired. And uh, after a lot of confusion, some clarity came in to, you know, what the best thing to do was. And all that's just to say, look, um, life and scripture and all of it can be really confusing. And we have to be diligent uh, to find clarity um, and, and to do the work sometimes that we just want to avoid. And in this question today, while it's so simple, I thought, you know, can Jesus accept me? I, yeah, but, and, and so I flipped the question a little bit because it really is more on us. And so here's the question I want to deal with. Is there anything I can do to become unacceptable, unacceptable to Jesus? Is there anything I can do to become unacceptable to Jesus? You may have wrestled with that or currently wrestling with that. And I, you know, we got to be honest. Um, we're all in the same boat, like with sin, right? Uh, if you're here and are perfect and have never messed up, then congratulations. But I, I just don't think that that's true. Um, we just have a rebellious nature in us. And that rebellious nature is called sin, 
that manifest in a whole lot of ways. I mean, we can get pretty creative with our sin. And, uh, but, but a lot of times, man, it's just that day after day, we stumble here, we stumble there, we fall into something or choose something that we know just isn't in God's plan for us. And as a kid, man, this, this is like where we're, you know, just chasing uh, sin in, in a sense. It, it, it manifests in us as a kid. We, we like wake up sometimes in our childhood and we're just looking for trouble. You got a kid like that, you know, they just wait, how am I going to sin today, man? How am I going to mess with mom and dad today? How am I going to get in trouble at school today? And whether you can get away with it or not is absolutely zero part of the equation until it is. And then it's a problem. Um, but you're not thinking about that. Back in the, the days, I'm going to show my age. I, Christy had to remind me of my age for service. I, I thought I was 50. She said, no, you're 51. And, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm sure I was still 50. But back in the, back in the days when the paddle, paddle was, was an acceptable form of punishment, it served as a, as a worthy deterrent. At least it did for me, by golly. I mean, I was scared to death of getting the paddle. Now, others, you know, not so much. They looked forward to it, I think, you know. Uh, but, but for me, I, I told the line. Now, my parents are in the service, and, and I'm going to put myself out there, but, but I think I was a, you know, pretty straight-laced dude, right? Okay, they're shaking their heads. Thank you. Um, but I had my moments, and when those moments came, the fly swatter was enacted, and it, shaking your head, anybody, the fly swatter was, you know, the, the deterrent, and um, yeah, it worked. But, but there was one time, and I, you guys will probably remember this, and, and this gentleman has passed on, so I want to be absolutely respectful, but uh, he's my social studies teacher in fourth grade. It was a long time ago, but I mean, it is vivid in my memory, um, and his name was Mr. Hurt, you know? <laughs> I mean, how good is that? Mr. Hurt, his face was Mr. Hurt. And, uh, and his paddle, it, it did some damage. Um, and, but, but his tactic, man, was, was not immediate. You get in trouble in his class, your name's going on the board, and you're going to suffer for 24 hours anticipating the moment when that paddle's going to hit your backside. And, uh, and I got in trouble in his class. You remember? You sort of, maybe? I don't know what I did, but I apparently did something worthy to get my name on that board. And you talk about the weight of the world, man. I mean, I was feeling it. And, uh, and so, uh, when I, and I don't think I said anything because I was like, I'm, you know, under the radar on this sucker. And I uh, go in the next day, and here it is, man. I, I get in the class, and my name is not on the board anymore. And I, you talk about relief. That was probably the greatest sense of relief in my entire life uh, when, when I realized I'm not going to get the paddle today. And you guys get this, right? You get the analogy. I mean, we, our sin puts our name squarely on that board of death and punishment, everything that Jesus took on our behalf. But it's erased. He took that for us. And so when we consider all the times we mess up, Man, all the, all the sin, all the bad decisions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down a list to be kind of specific here um, because I want to be clear about the stuff we do. So, like lying, that's one of those maybe, man, we just find ourselves white lie here, half truth here, and then we're just in a pattern of lying. Does, does that make me unsavable? Like, I, I've lied. Am, am I going to hell because I, I lied? And the answer is because of Jesus no. No, you're not. And what about cheating? No. Cursing? No, fortunately. Missing, missing church? No, that, that's not unforgivable. That doesn't make you unredeemable. Listening to, to rock music, you know, like I listen to Bon Jovi, does that knock me out of heaven? Yeah, of course not. Uh, you know, you sing listen, living on a prayer, right? You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Doing, doing drugs, does that, make me, does that make me unredeemable? Does that make me unsavable, unacceptable by doing drugs? No. You know, getting, getting divorced, 
Is that like, now that's, you can't, that's, un- no, that's, that's redeemable. What about having an abortion? No. Sexual immorality, no. Gossip, slander, no. Gluttony, no. And on and on, the, the creative ways we can sin sometimes. Does all that remove us from God's grace? No. It's true, everything we mentioned and more is, is not unforgivable or unredeemable, but they're sin. They are sins, and, and Jesus forgives our sins. Not so, not so we can keep on sinning, as Paul writes, but that we can be raised to new life. Romans 6, 1 through 4. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And then here it is. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And that is good news. We put our trust in Jesus. Now, that list and more that we just went through didn't include blasphemy. And this was where, when I'm prepping this, getting into this, I'm realizing, man, this text that we're gonna look at here in a minute, the text that Mark Moore uses in this week's study, is from Matthew 12. Man, we get into demon ex- demons and exorcism, blasphemy, you know, some, some issues eter- like eternal security, once saved, always saved theology. And I'm like, this is, I didn't sign up for this, Fitz. You know, Fitz has got the master in divinity. I got the music degree. And, uh, you know, so um, while we are certainly, and those topics um, demand a lot of time and study and clarity, again, we are gonna move through this somewhat quickly, addressing these issues, but particularly in the area of blasphemy. Let's, Let's start with our, text today in Matthew 12, verse 22, from the New Living Translation. It says, then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. He healed the man so that he could both speak and see. The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? Great question. But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Now, the uh, Pharisees, um, if you're not familiar, these these are uh, righteous, self-righteous men of the law, well-studied, well-versed, but they cross a significant line at this point in giving credit where credit is not due. It's nothing new in their pattern of behavior and their encounters with Jesus, but this time they've, they've kind of stuck their foot in their mouth, really, uh, because they are, are grossly misguided and giving credit to Satan for what the Holy Spirit had done, and, G- and Jesus is about to call them out on it in a significant way that only Jesus could. And without reading that entire text, I'll leave that for you to go back in your personal study and dive into this, but here's, here's kind of in summary what Jesus says. Number one, everybody knows that a house divided cannot stand and that Satan would be, if Satan cast out Satan, in other words, Satan's power casting out a demon, he's destroying his own work. It's illogical. And then number two, Jesus reminded them, the Pharisees, that their own exorcists were casting out demons. So Pharisees, is it you that are also working for Satan? He used their own thinking and processing against them. And then finally, and most importantly, Jesus says this in verses 28 through 30. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. 
And this was a serious show of strength and power when Jesus speaks. And it's in this moment he utters these words and what brings us kind of to our point of maybe confusion, challenge, what do we do with this? So I tell you every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, even except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. And so it was, it was one thing for the Pharisees to blaspheme, or in other words, ridicule, to mock Jesus, even Jesus himself. And that's what's somewhat stunning about this, Jesus saying, you can mock me and ridicule, and I can forgive you for that. But you mock, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. This is a, a different level. And so what is it? Why is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and his works so horrible, so reprehensible, so outrageous that forgiveness becomes impossible? Is there anything I can do that makes me unacceptable? It's sounding like maybe there is, in fact. All the things we mentioned earlier, maybe not, but blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So what, what is that? When we say blaspheme the Holy Spirit, here, here's a kind of a definition of that. Starting with the willful, and that's really important. The willful, intentional, now the wide-eyed, slandering, of the work of the Holy Spirit, attributing to the devil what is undeniably divine. The Pharisees, you and I, have seen clearly what Jesus can do. The Pharisees understood as lucidly as anyone could understand that Jesus performed his miracles by the power of the Spirit, and yet, yet they defiantly insisted, contrary to what they knew to be true, that it was Satan who empowered him. Now, when you study this week and read through the chapter that Mark Moore wrote, he uses a really great illustration here. It's called the knot, K-N-O-T illustration. And it'll just, it helped me and I think it'll help you grasp this a little bit more when we're talking about what's forgivable and what's unforgivable. And the implications of that are really the, the idea. So check that out, read that, make note of that in your study this week, the knot illustration. But from the prophecies and the festivals of the Old Testament, the the temple, get to the New Testament, Jesus' teaching and his miracles, these are what we could call credentials of heaven, proof of heaven. The Pharisees had been present when Jesus healed the sick. They, they saw him perform miracles up close and, and personal. They witnessed him raise the dead, for goodness sakes. They watched with their very eyes as skin infected with leprosy suddenly and decisively became clean and smooth and whole. They heard him teach with power and, and authority. They, they watched as demons fled his presence as he set free those in bondage and they watched with their own eyes as he gave sight to the blind. Yet again, they openly and persistently and even angrily and arrogantly declared he did it by the power of the devil, arrogantly. To be clear, this was not a one-time offense. This passage we read in, in Matthew is one of many encounters or moments, even really a season of rebellion and denial. Beyond that, it was really who they had become. This wasn't just, oh, you know, bad call, my bad. This was like who they were. In other words, their heart, their inner soul, their inner person had become so removed and uh, unwelcoming of the Spirit of God that their only acknowledgement was the work of Satan. And according to Jesus, you do this. You develop a daily pattern. You develop a daily pattern of willful, wide-eyed slandering, the work of the Spirit, and you give credit to, you attribute to the devil 
what is undeniably divine. According to Jesus, you do this, and you have removed yourself from being accepted. You have become unacceptable. Not because God's grace and the work of Christ isn't offered and isn't available, but because you have chosen to deny it. And so that's, I believe, the truth of Scripture. Is there a way that I can become unacceptable? Simply deny and give credit to the work of Satan, and you have removed yourself from the work of the Spirit in your life. And so for the seeker today, um, you're here and you're like, I'm afraid maybe I've done that. Or those things you were talking about earlier, I've done a lot of that. Um, Is there hope? Is there hope? And the answer is yes, there is hope for the seeker. If you're in the room today, if you're online with us, or if you are just simply asking the question, am I right with Jesus? Can Jesus accept me? Then then you've already begun the process to respond and acknowledge to the work of the Spirit in your life. You're acknowledging that he is valid, and that he is prompting you to that which can save and deliver and restore. And here's, here's the good news. He, being Jesus, can, he is able, and he will. Remember the list earlier. It's not exhaustive, but the point is you can bring it, and he can forgive it, and you will be accepted. John 3.16, an older version says, whosoever... Today we say everyone, and that is absolute true. Everyone who believes and calls on the name of the Lord. For those of you who have done that, made Jesus Lord, Savior of your life, it was years ago or recently, but things happen. You stumble a little bit. You think back, was that really my call? Was that my decision? Felt kind of pushed into it. All the, all the things that Satan can use to create doubt in our life, to question our salvation, our security in Christ. I want to speak to you for a moment on that. Um, you may be struggling with some of that. The answer is yes. Jesus accepts you. He has and he does and he will. The transformative process that is going on in your life and my life today is a lifelong journey that has its ups and downs. A person who is genuinely, listen close, a person who has genuinely and personally surrendered their life to Christ, expressing their belief, their belief in him, confessing their sins, and this is so important, expressing their sins, confessing their sins with a repentant heart, a heart that says, I want to walk away from that and towards Jesus doesn't mean I've just let it all go, but I'm moving towards Christ now. And I'm dropping this baggage one bag at a time as Jesus takes it. A repentant heart. And has been immersed in the waters of baptism. That person can rest assured in Christ's acceptance of you and your future in heaven. Does that mean we coast the rest of the way? We read that earlier. Of course not. Does that mean if we stumble, we're in some kind of jeopardy or timeout? No. We just keep pressing on each day. Just like Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I love that passage and the challenge for us today. And I hope you will receive that. In closing, a moment ago, I went through several credentials, proofs, of heaven, the signs and wonders of Jesus' ministry that were intended to point us to the power of the Spirit working in and through Jesus. Before the Pharisees, they just weren't enough. Are you like that? You, you see something, you say, okay, yeah, but what about this? Show me this. Do this. And we want more, and we want more, and we want more. 
And throughout the Gospels, there's this pattern of the Pharisees always wanting another sign, a, a healing, or, or Jesus, do another exorcism, but it just wasn't enough. And so Jesus responds in this way. He says, one day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. Here it is. Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. The only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And we know that is prophecy of his resurrection from the dead. He points them towards what will be the ultimate display of power and undeniable authority, not by Satan, but by God Almighty himself. And this is the blessed assurance, the blessed hope for all of us, the reality that the same power that raised Jesus is more than sufficient to raise you and me back to life. And so if you're barely hanging on this morning, life has you down, doubt is creeping in or is taking full residence, then look to the resurrection Look to the one thing that provides beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is the author of life and you are invited to come as you are, but never the same afterwards. He is calling your name today. Will you respond? Will you acknowledge and believe in the true source of hope and life and redemption? Listen close. Salvation is purposed by the Father. It is his will, his desire for us. It is purposed by the Father. It is accomplished. It is finished. It is done by the Son and applied by the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit's agency or action that we acknowledge in our salvation, all that Christ has accomplished brings no value to us as scripture clearly presents the spirit graciously and effectively gives us Christ Jesus and every blessing that he has secured. Our salvation is in Christ alone and is by his spirit alone. Can Jesus accept me? Yes, yes he can. Will you accept him? You decide. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. Your love endures forever. Lord, you are good. And your love endures forever. Your mercy and your grace are abundant and clear and available for every one. May we Acknowledge the work of the Spirit, pointing us to the source of life, you. And may we accept that. The mystery, the reality, the truth, all of it. Not so that we can explain it, but that we can live in it, represent you in it, share it every day. And as we worship you and sing to you. May this be our testimony of what you have done and many of us brought us from death to life. And for those seeking that, may today be the day they do that. In Christ's name, amen.